I think one way to think of it is when you have chronic infection that adversely affects the brain, it has different effects at different points in a person's life. If it affects fetal development, we see developmental disorders and autism. If it's in midlife, we may see depression, anxiety, cognitive impairments. If it's an early life, it, and sometimes fetal, it, it may show a psychosis like bipolar or schizophrenia. If it's in later life, it can cause, it can be associated with dementia. But in all those cases, what they have in common is there's a uh, provocation of the immune system and there's close communication between the immune system and the nervous system. The stealth infections are in general uh, bacterial but in some cases viral infections. They, they get inside and hide inside cells and they can't be seen by the immune system. Chronic persistent low-grade infections. The most common stealth infections that are related to chronic illnesses are uh, number one mycoplasma, chlamydia pneumoniae, Borrelia burgdorferi, which is the, one of the causative components of Lyme disease, which is a complex illness involving not only Borrelia, but mycoplasma and other infections as well. Uh, Babesia comes up. Um, certain viruses, herpes 1, 2, 6, toxoplasmosis. But there's other infections that are not well identified. And those are invariably, as a group, these slow-growing, relapsing stealth infections that stay in the body in a low-grade way and slowly impact and have a, a effect over time. Uh, all these infections uh, tend to not only spread throughout the body but they tend to end up in areas like the central nervous system where they can cause tremendous havoc. There are, there are logistical issues, political issues, uh, well that, that sit alongside all the medical issues. So not only are people returning positives for Borrelia, they're also returning positives against Babesia and Rickettsia and Ehrlichia and Anaplasma. So there are other tick-borne pathogens that are on board as well. So we need a broader research span and the clinicians need to be aware of this when they are investigating their patients. There is so much more that needs to be considered. So these other co-infections are critical in the assessment of these clinical patients. So we really need to identify which species we have of those other genospecies, the Bartonella, the Rickettsia, the Babesia, the Ehrlichia, as well as the Borrelia and that's what we will be doing within our research as well. We got some requests at the beginning and, and basically we, we stopped doing it after a while mainly because none of the practitioners were asking for it and I mean we're a, a laboratory we, we need to have a doctor ask us to do a particular test we don't go out and find patients and tell them we want to test them. If you look back over history, we've got something like 150 years of medical research that indicated some cancers have been caused by infection. We know that Helicobacter causes stomach cancer, now nobody ever talked about that. We know that chlamydia and pneumoniae can trigger off cancers. Mycoplasma fermentans, absolutely, as well. Mycoplasma fermentans has been found in the growing edge of breast cancers and we know with Mycoplasma fermentans it switches on oncogenes, it switches on inflammatory cascades, so it shifts our interleukin cascades. I mean it's a really nasty, nasty little bacteria. If you only think of it, if you know about it, it's kind of, again, it's really simple. Um, that's how it works in medicine, you know, consider this as part of your differential diagnosis. There needs to be a hand on the rudder approach. Every time we make a little change with the rudder, we have to see what difference it makes. And 
monitor the patient and maybe change again, keep on increasing or broadening the treatment or drop it back or add something else to support. We need to work out whether or not what's happening is a deterioration because of the infective or other processes or is it a Herxheimer reaction as a result of the treatment or is it something else entirely. It's, it's difficult, it's a complex process, every patient is different, every doctor-patient relationship is different and um, there's, there's no one way. There's just such a lack of understanding about it. No one knows about it in this country and, and no one... Uh, I didn't quite understand it for a long time until Julian slowly taught me about it and I read some information from him and um, then I could have some more insight into his condition. You know, one minute he's fine, the next minute he's going through... Um, he's slowly deteriorating. And he's not one to put things on, so... He, he suffered very silently. How can something go from Parkinson's to non-Parkinson's so quickly? It was, it was bizarre, Dad. We walk in and Dad's going, look, look at what I can do. And he hadn't been able to do that in so long and he was arching his back in the bed and I'm saying, Dad, should you be doing this? It was just as if something had turned off the Parkinson's. This whole process that's happened to me is a little bit like being in a totally dark room and to be lost in that room, not knowing which way out, and suddenly for there to be a light shining over in one corner. A smart person would go towards that light, but the researchers don't appear to want to go towards the light. And I've become very cynical and very... I find it very difficult to give credibility to a lot of medical areas now because nobody really wants to look at anything except with their blinkers on in their particular area. Well, education is the best defense, but it has to be accurate information and fair balanced. You have to look at a broad base of information from many sources. You want to look at evolutionary biology, look at disease theory, look at fundamental biology, look at psychiatry, look at uh, immunology, look at infectious disease, you have to look at that and pull that all together. You can't just look at one small area. And you have to look at clinical feedback and expertise, and that, that's very helpful. I, I think the problem has been that there's certain people that have been invested in a very rigid definition, and their reputations, their research grants, and large amounts of money are dependent upon which definition prevails.